Um, cool. Well, I guess I'll just I'll just introduce you formally for those of you who aren't for those uh, viewers who aren't maybe familiar. So you're the Leopold Muller Professor of Border Migration and International Affairs, and the William Golding Senior Professor in Politics um, at Brazenose College. So I think it's probably fair to say that you are you're an expert on the on the topic of refugees. Right? Is that is that a fair description? Yeah, the, the titles are a bit of a mouthful, but I think the easiest thing is to say that. Um, I'm a social scientist and I work mainly on refugees. That's perfect. Cool. So I guess refugees are by their nature always in a state of crisis, but we there's obviously a bigger crisis going on in the world right now. Are we are there any refugee crises that we're we're neglecting that really maybe we shouldn't we not necessarily could say we should be paying attention to because obviously COVID is taking up a lot of the world's attention, but are there cri refugee crises going on that we should be paying more attention to at the moment? Um, I think um, obviously people's attention is on COVID-19 and, and the media finds it difficult to focus on more than a couple of things at any one time. Um, in 2015 and 16, Europe in particular, but the wider world focused very much on the refugee crisis as it was labelled, when in the space of a year over a million asylum seekers came to Europe and then we had sort of wall-to-wall -wall coverage and that coverage has waned, but it's not like the displacement issue has gone away. In fact, around the world on a global scale, there are more people displaced now than at any time since the Second World War. Um, there are about 75 million people displaced. Now the majority of those are internally displaced in their own country, but still we have over 25 million refugees. Now that 25 million figure is as high as it has been um, since we started recording the data. So people are being displaced by war, conflict, and specifically fragile states. So that category of fragile states is, is pretty vague. It means different things. But there are a lot of governments around the world that really struggle to meet the most basic needs of their citizens. And there are some obvious ones like Syria, um, Venezuela, um, some long-standing ones like Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan, but there are others where we've got conflicts emerging under the radar that displace lots of people. So Yemen, Central African Republic, um, the deterioration of conditions in South Sudan. Over the last few months, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo has, has plunged into violence again. And so we tend to not focus on those conflicts and crises as much um, when the world is focused on COVID-19. But the second dimension, which I think is really interesting in your question, is actually people are often not thinking about the relationship between COVID-19 and refugees. And one of the things closer to home is that a lot of governments, particularly rich governments around the world, are using the fact of lockdown and restrictions in international travel to make it harder than ever for asylum seekers to cross international borders. So the United States, for instance, is using health as a justification for security measures to detain and deport Haitians back to Haiti on the grounds that in a pandemic um, that supposedly becomes necessary. Other countries are pushing people back uh, to countries they might not get away with pushing them back to if there was greater media scrutiny. So from kind of Europe pushing people back to Libya, um, to Greece pushing people back to Turkey, there are practices around the world that we're not seeing that are very difficult and challenging. And, and in sort of the global south, as it were, um, some countries over the last few months, like uh, Kenya, for instance, Uganda, have created lockdown conditions where food assistance hasn't reached non-citizens, so refugees have been particularly affected. So there's a lot going on. And just because we don't see as much of it doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah, and, and I mean, is it right to say that now, if, if ever, more than ever, it's vital to kind of be paying attention to, to these refugee crises because in the conditions that a lot of them, you know, large numbers of refugees are having to live in, they're not probably not going to be getting uh, adequate health care. They're going to be cooped up in very large numbers. So they must be surely really affected by, by coronavirus in a way that we probably have no appreciation for. Well, I mean, COVID-19 has sort of effects at three levels. There's the, the health implications, there's lockdown implications, and then there's the global economy. And of course, the health implications are serious because many refugees, particularly in camps, don't have the luxury of being able to socially distance. Um, isolation isn't often an option in refugee camps or 
densely populated cities around the world. But actually, many of the refugees that, that I've spoken to in the crisis have said, we're actually less worried about the health implications and the virus um, than the secondary effects of lockdown and um, the economic consequences. So in cities, and more refugees around the world are now in cities than in, in camps, um, lockdown is destroying the informal economy. People can't trade, buy and sell things on an informal basis. And the informal economy is the lifeline um, to refugees in cities that don't have access to humanitarian aid or assistance. And even in camps, the informal economy that surrounds those camps is often crucial and is affected. So that, that's an immediate consequence of lockdown. But I think the really frightening thing in a sense is that we're facing a, a global recession. And what we know from the social science is that um, when we've had recessions in the past, like the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, a much lesser recession in a sense, we know that economic downturn has major effects on the causes of displacement, has consequences for people displaced, and shapes how governments respond to those displaced. So in terms of causes, recession increases authoritarianism, conflict, and fragile states, the drivers of displacement. Recession, we know already from studies that have been taking place over the last few months, that many refugees around the world are disproportionately more likely to be in the economic sectors that are being affected by COVID-19 and, and the economic legacy. Um, and in terms of responses, when we get downturns, that's when public attitudes turn against migration, asylum and refugees. And, and so we know that from the past. And so the economic implications will exacerbate at all levels. Put, put simply, needs will go up, but the willingness to provide, whether through opening borders or giving money, is likely to go down. So that's the context we're in. Yeah, and, and, and talking of economic downturns, we are obviously in the process of, of leaving the, the European Union who have um, recently unveiled a new migration pact. Are you concerned about the fact that Britain now looks to be taking less of an active role in the kind of like in, in migrant crises and, and, and in taking in refugees when really it should be taking more of an active role? I mean, I think the UK was always sort of at the margins of the European Union when it came to asylum and immigration policy. And it, it, it's had the luxury, of, if you put it that way, of um, being able to hide behind territory and water. And so the rules of the common European asylum system have meant that it's the first countries of arrival, countries like Greece and Italy, crudely the frontline states that have responsibility for assessing asylum claims and protecting those people recognized as refugees. So the numbers coming to the UK have been small and the UK has where appropriate or where it felt it appropriate, exercised its veto to not contribute to things like relocating large numbers of people from Greece and Italy. Uh, or contributing significantly to EU budgets to, to address refugee and displacement issues. So Britain's position has always been a bit marginal to that. Um, over the last five years, British refugee policy became about restricting the numbers of so-called spontaneous arrival asylum seekers, essentially the number of people that come across the English Channel. We see more of that over recent days. And trying to focus more on resettlement, taking a small number of vulnerable people, particularly focusing on families and unaccompanied minors, directly from refugee camps, alongside using DFID to put large amounts of money into humanitarian and development aid in the neighboring countries where most refugees are based, countries like Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, etc. Now, what's happened is we've seen um, even greater restriction than ever in the UK um, on spontaneous arrival asylum. The language we've heard over the last week is that the British government, and particularly the Home Secretary, want to end that route. They want to make it no longer viable to spontaneously cross the English Channel. Now, the difficulty with that is that's about the only way you can claim asylum in Britain. To claim asylum in Britain, you can't make a claim generally outside of Britain. You have to get to British territory. But to get to British territory, there aren't legal pathways, so you end up having to enter quote unquote, illegally. And so there's been a clamp down on that, but there hasn't necessarily been a proportionate increase in the numbers of people prepared, that Britain's prepared to relocate through resettlement to the UK. Now, I was at a meeting, um, a British Greek symposium meeting last week, which is 
uh, a mixture of politicians from Greece and, and Britain. And, and one of the things I said was, well, in the aftermath of the Moria tragedy, 13,000 people losing their homes, refugees on the Greek island of, of Lesbos, um, some European countries like Germany stepped up and relocated people. Britain's role was comparatively small. Why can't Britain, given that it wants to redefine itself as global Britain, playing an active role in the world, why can't Britain bilaterally commit to relocate a certain number of people every year from Greece who arrive crossing the Mediterranean, crossing the Aegean? And I think that's where Britain needs to play a role. Now, we need to recognize that it has to be politically sustainable, that trying to argue that Britain should take a, a, a really open door policy is not gonna fly politically. But what we can do, even um, connected to the government's own agenda around asylum and immigration is say, okay, post-Brexit, if we want this country to play a leading role in the world, if we want it to set an example for Europe, then one means to do that is to say, okay, where and how can we resettle refugees from other parts of the world where we know they're vulnerable, for instance, the example of Moria, and ensure they have a safe passage to the UK? And how can we do that in a way that reflects what, what most politicians agree is a proud tradition of Britain providing sanctuary to Jews fleeing Nazi Germany, to Ugandan Asians fleeing Idi Amin's regime of the 1970s, um, Britain's role when people were fleeing Bosnia and Kosovo, that this actually patriotic narratives shouldn't be used as an example to exclude refugees. We can reappropriate them as an argument to say, part of what it means to be British is to provide leadership on human rights and, and access to safe passage for refugees. Yeah, so, so these, um, these patriotic narratives, as you say, that are being used to fuel anti-immigration sentiment, that's not, that's not just a British thing, is it? I mean, is is it a serious problem this kind of move towards nationalism in, in first world countries such as you know britain america france countries who are probably best best place to take refugees you know in a, in a good position to take them in is that something that we actually really need to be concerned about that even if this just tends that turns out to be a temporary kind of political um shift towards nationalist sentiment that actually it's really damaging if for quite a few years we just we stop taking in refugees and we are really hostile towards migrants 2016 was the, the big spike in populist nationalism. Um, Trump was elected in the US. Across Europe, we saw the rise of far-right parties from UK Independence Party in the UK to Golden Dawn in Greece to um, Front National in France. Um, we saw Salvini in Italy, Orban in Hungary. All of those politicians were pushing an anti-immigration position quite opportunistically for electoral purposes. And immigration became the scapegoat, became, became the rallying call. And in many cases, the people who were voting for anti-immigration parties were not living in areas of their countries that had large numbers of migrants. So in Germany, voters for Alternative for Deutschland disproportionately came from areas where there weren't large numbers of migrants, yeah, please, but yeah. there was a gutting of labor intensive manufacturing. The same in the United States, the most liberal progressive parts of the US are those with high numbers of, of immigrants and huge amounts of ethnic diversity. And those generally voting for Trump were those that were often not um, particularly diverse, didn't have large immigrant populations, but again, had a history of um, the, the undermining of labor intensive manufacturing. And so immigration became the kind of proxy issue when the underlying concerns were more about automation, offshoring, structural change in the global economy, jobs moving first from Europe and the United States uh, to East Asia, to Southeast Asia, and then being lost to artificial intelligence, automation, et cetera. And I think 2016 was the moment where immigration provided the rallying call for the far right. I suppose what will be interesting after COVID-19 is to see if that endures. Now, the immigration debate isn't as public, it isn't as obvious. Will we see, as public priorities change, as different issues emerge as more salient, such as public health, um, such as um, unemployment, um, such as the economic agenda, will that mean that the people that were ostensibly very concerned with immigration are less concerned with that? 
And so we see a political alignment and the issues that matter change. And will that in turn mean that the people who care more about progressive immigration policies, progressive asylum policies, actually have more voice and are less, and the terms of the debate are less determined by the far right. So I don't know whether that will happen. There's, there's a lot of reasons to be cautious and possibly even pessimistic, not least the coming global recession and what that will do. But I think there's a political realignment coming and what it will mean for populist nationalism will be an interesting reckoning. That's interesting because 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 what I wanted to ask was what what do we do what do we do about these people who they respond to maybe the the, pro, the difficult circumstances that they find themselves in you know in, in say in, in in East Germany where they've got you know a, a lack of um they've got a lack of kind of support and infrastructure and they they feel that their lives are, are not um not as they should be and people who are choosing to blame that on immigrant crises because is it a question of of, of education or how how do you how do you reach out to people who who have such hostile attitudes towards um, refugees because it really is it's causing serious problems isn't it yeah i mean germany's played a fascinating role um i mean in the early 90s they received a large number of people fleeing particularly bosnia in the balkans and as a result they sort of created this almost they used the eu to create an almost cordon sanitaire around germany so that germany wouldn't take large numbers of asylum seekers and that was blown apart in 2015 when large numbers of Syrians arrived spontaneously at the border, and Angela Merkel said, Wir schaffen das, we're a big country, we will cope, um, and decided to say, okay, we as a country want to adopt um, a Willkommenskultur, we want to have a welcoming culture, um, we want refugees to be welcome. Um, and a lot of German civil society embraced that, but partly that was a crudely put West German response. And obviously the history of, of Germany is, is diverse and complex and different regions of the country have responded differently. And so I think areas, particularly of former East Germany, um, areas like Saxony that have become supporters of Alternative for Deutschland, haven't got large immigrant populations, didn't receive large numbers of Syrians, but felt a loss of control, probably linked to changes in the global economy having had the undermining of the labor intensive manufacturing jobs that were present, particularly during communism, but also in the aftermath of reunification that have subsequently been lost. And so they tilted against. Now, there's therefore been a polarization in the German debate that Bierschaff and Das ended up being quite short lived. By, by early 2016, Merkel was collaborating with Turkey on the EU-Turkey deal, was working to close the Balkan route, and make it much more difficult to get to Germany. You had a rise in, in voting for alternative for Deutschland, some public panic around that, and an attempt by Germany to re-establish some kind of consensus of which the kind of latest European Commission report that you alluded to, the proposal for a so-called new pact on migration and asylum is kind of a consequence. It, it comes from the president of the commission now being a German, the German presidency of the European Council launching that, it's Germany again trying to build consensus and say, okay, we can't do what we did in 2015. We've got to take a more middle of the road consensus based approach to the issue. That's interesting. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about your work. So you've worked in an advisory capacity with, with a number of governments, correct? How would you, if, how would you assess kind of their attitude? Would you say that you found them frustrating to work with in terms of have they been have they had genuinely good intentions and have they been willing to kind of commit to the kind of change that you, that you obviously would want to see? I think, I mean, I work with a diverse range of governments. So it's, it's not just kind of rich world governments that I speak to. It's also some of the poorest countries in the world. And it's worth remembering that 85% of refugees are in low and middle income countries. Most refugees are not in Europe, are not in North America. We need a certain sense of perspective. And it's, it's difficult to say that there's a sort of common um, experience I have talking to policymakers or elected officials. Um, I suppose part of the general experience though is that governments are usually made of individuals, up of individuals, and individuals have different and diverse motives. Most politicians are politicians who on one level want to get elected want to stay in office, 
and want to serve their constituents. And that means that there's often a bottom line of saying, okay, if I'm going to do this, how is it going to retain some sense of public legitimacy? How am I going to retain support for this from the people who are, have elected me and who I'm elected to serve? And so it's quite sobering for me to recognise that when I propose things, there is that, um, that's a bottom line that the people who are going to be the audience have to consider, can we take the public with us? Can we get that support from the host communities, from the citizens of the country? And I think that's a fairly universal experience. Now, a lot of politicians go into politics because they want to do some good in the world, because they want to serve. And so the challenge for them is how to reconcile doing something good that supports the protection of refugees, supports human rights, but balancing that against the concerns, valid or sometimes invalid, of citizens in the host society. So I think that's, that's a really common experience. Now, across Europe at the moment, one of the troubling things is I hear across the political spectrum, not just centre-right parties, but also centre-left governments, um, including in some of the traditionally most liberal regions of Europe, like Scandinavia, saying, we're not sure that spontaneous arrival asylum is sustainable. We have questions about the long-term viability of the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees. We're not sure if those things can maintain public support. And a lot of them are not subject area experts. So when I speak to those governments, part of it is trying to uh, explain in simple accessible terms what academic research can do to inform them, to help them have better narratives, to make their arguments stronger and more robust when they work domestically, but also internationally with other governments and international organizations, and build some consensus behind the scenes. But those are the kinds of dynamics that I'm often forced to take into account. When it comes to countries in the so-called developing worlds, lower and middle income countries, there's often a different set of concerns. There's a concern about, okay, we as countries take in large numbers of refugees, we, we fulfill our obligations as best we can, but we often don't get the support internationally that we think is needed. So they're often concerned to attract development assistance, humanitarian assistance, but also private sector investment that can benefit the refugees they're hosting, but also benefit citizens. And so I often hear from countries, whether it's across East Africa, or Latin American countries hosting large numbers of Venezuelan refugees, the question of what can we learn from other parts of the world about how to attract more development assistance, more private sector investment that can, yes, help us integrate refugees, but also benefit the entire region they're host in which they're hosted. So it's kind of a case of finding a way of which a good refugee policy for those countries can also be a good host community policy. How can there be benefits for everyone? How can it be win-win? And so part of, of my advisory work is about knowledge, information, evidence, comparative analysis that gives examples to politicians of where best practices have worked, where they can try different things. Part of it is often about um, trying to build behind the scenes the basis of some kind of consensus across and between those governments. So being able to um, allow hosting governments in the global south to understand some of the positions of northern donor countries and enable many northern countries to also understand the position difficult positions that many host countries are in and uh, and sort of cross fertilize some of that knowledge and evidence that's really interesting and how, how would you uh, this, this may be difficult but how would you kind of compare the government's you work with to maybe like say the businesses and the, the international organizations like how do they has there been notable difference in kind of the way they function like their the way they kind of how committed they are to, to kind of um to, to making change and, and and achieving things and sort of some more kind of altruistic things because a lot of people have quite negative stereotypes about say you know international or international like bodies that um, the kind that you've worked with but how have you found them to work with compared to government i mean just really crudely i mean governments exist primarily to serve their citizens and so that forms a major constraint. Um, international organisations mainly exist 
to serve governments, or but they, albeit that they often have mandates that are longer term, which means that they can hold those mandates up and try to say to governments, you need to be accountable for the international legal standards you've committed to. And businesses, for the most part, have to be accountable for creating shareholder value, um, but can sometimes have other bottom lines that are not just about profit, but are also about sustainability, social impact, etc. When you work with, um, with governments, it's again, often about the individuals, where do their own values and commitments come from? And how, how much leadership are they prepared to offer, to take risks, to articulate something that takes the population with them, rather than just following what they see the opinion polls as telling them. When you work with international organizations, it's again about finding people who are prepared to take a leadership role and take risks to say, okay, we know that the governments that fund us want these things, but we're prepared to speak back to them and provide some direction and leadership using our moral authority, using our expert authority. And I suppose my worry with many UN organizations is finding the personalities that are bold enough, uh, entrepreneurial enough to take those risks, to lead governments rather than just follow governments. And when it comes to business, I think there's been a rising interest in multinational corporations, in refugees since the refugee crisis. But a lot of it's led by corporate social responsibility departments, uh, sustainability departments, the side of the business that crudely is looking to associate the brand with doing good things in the world. And what needs to happen is that it needs to be more at the executive level, it needs to be CEOs, it needs to be boardroom level engagement in order for the commitments to be meaningful, to be about job creation for refugees, to be about integrating refugees in supply chains, to be about making private sector training and upskilling available to refugee communities around the world. And so there it's about, again, finding leaders at an individual level who are CEOs, who can take their company with them, that can persuade shareholders that there's uh, a multiple bottom line, that this can work with the core business, but also do good in the world. So the commonality across all of those types of organizations is it's about finding the individuals that are prepared to lead rather than just follow and in some cases take a bit of a risk okay so as we've as we've kind of um touched upon briefly you so you are in a sense an academic but you have done a lot in terms of real world change because I, I, the, the jordan compact when i was reading about it really struck me as, as quite um very very impressive how does it like feel for you knowing that you've noticeably changed the landscape of the area that you study was that always what you wanted to do or is that something that you has, has kind of happened along the way i mean i i am an academic um but i i think social scientists um have to be engaged with the world so there are an infinite number of things we could work on um but the choices we make about what we work on are ultimately motivated by what our values are some of the changes we want to see in the world and so I think social scientists need to produce knowledge that is evidence-based, where if you make a claim, you can point to some body of evidence or research that supports it. Um, but equally, there's no point in that research just sitting in journal articles on, on dusty library shelves. It needs to get out into the world and produce change. And politicians and policymakers are not sitting in libraries spending their whole time reading peer-reviewed journal articles. They need policy briefs. They need people to explain the research to them. They need different media to present and disseminate that. And so part of what I try to do is that element of policy engagement and also public engagement to explain things to the public through the media, um, through broadcast, through uh, public talks, through books that hopefully some people can read who are not just in academia. Um, and I think that's an important role um, that social scientists can play and, and, and should play in the world. And so I see that as an extension of, of what it is to be an academic in this area, particularly given how important and central it is to, to the world. Now, that doesn't mean that everything I say gets perfectly implemented. So you mentioned the Jordan Compact, for instance. Um, that stemmed from, in 2015, um, when we had the Syrian refugee crisis, 
the host countries in the region being really skeptical about providing Syrian refugees with jobs. And Jordan, one of the few very stable countries in that region, didn't give Syrians the right to work. Um, it was worried that it would displace Jordanians from the labor market, that it would displace other migrant workers from Egypt with whom Jordan had a very strong bilateral agreement. And so what me and my colleague Paul Collier wanted to try to do was say, was there a way in which Jordan could be persuaded to let Syrians work? And while we were in the country, we visited the Zatari refugee camp, home to over 80,000 Syrians at the time. And we heard from refugees saying, we just want to be able to work. We just want to be able to support our families. And we heard from parents whose children had gone back to fight in Syria because of the lack of options and alternatives in Jordan. And we were taken to visit one of a number of pre-existing special economic zones that was just 15 minutes from, um, from um, the refugee camp. And we were told that they had everything, but they didn't have anyone working there. Um, and yet we just heard 15 minutes away that there were lots of people who wanted to work. So we said to the Jordanian government, hang on, couldn't we put these things together and allow refugees to have the choice if they want to, to work? And could we use that as a starting point to create, albeit a limited right to work, but an expandable right to work. And the Jordan Compact involved money from the World Bank, money from the European Union, money from the British government, going to support Jordan's response to Syrians, but also a commitment from Jordan to provide work permits to Syrian refugees, and also allow Syrian businesses that had previously been operating in Syria to relocate onto Jordanian territory and set up manufacturing businesses in those existing economic zones. So it was a case of that just worked. Now, as academics, we didn't do that alone. It relied upon being able to articulate that to the Hashemite royal family in Jordan, to senior government ministers in Jordan, to get feedback from NGOs, to get feedback from the UN organizations, bring that back to DFID, and then have politicians from the British government engage with it. And the danger is that when you propose things, the outcome is not always exactly what you propose. And so I think with something like that, the outcome is frankly mixed. The success is there have been some 200,000 work permits provided to Syrian refugees. The right to work has been created. The downside is that aspects of it haven't been perfect. So a lot of Syrians haven't wanted the jobs in the sectors that have been available. A lot of them have been very gendered jobs that haven't worked especially well for the garment sector for women's needs who have decided not to take those jobs. And so some of it you look at with hindsight and say, I'm really pleased we achieved this, but actually we can learn from this that some things didn't work as well as we might have wished they would. Okay, so I just want to go back a little bit to, uh, you, you mentioned public engagement and, that, and that's really interesting. Like we mentioned before, there was a, a few years ago, there was you know a, a really high level of kind of public interest and attention on, on migrant crises. And I guess that's, that, that's surely a good thing. That's when kind of stuff gets done when there's um, so much collective attention on it. But as we mentioned, that can be quite kind of fleeting and fickle. So where for you, how do you find it easy to get involved in the kind of more, not necessarily activist, but more kind of public, public side of things compared to what you do, which is obviously kind of very technical and very academic. Is that quite a difficult thing? Do you find that you're able to do both? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things about being an academic is it's multiple roles in one job. I mean, even in a university, you're a researcher, you're a teacher, you're an administrator. And then once you try and sort of have public impact, then, then you end up being an author, a broadcaster, a public speaker, um, a, a mediocre opinion piece writer. Um, and I think it, it, it's sometimes challenging to multitask across multiple fronts. But I try to think of these things as complementary, that if you do good research, then that can inform your teaching. It can also inform um, what you have to say to the public and policy. And the only difference is the language you use, changing it from something that's often quite technical or engage with the literature in the way it would be in a peer reviewed journal article to something that's hopefully a bit more accessible. But it's a fantastic check and balance. I mean, if I'm if I'm doing research and I can't explain it to uh, my family, my friends, uh, a stranger who I meet, then it really makes me question what I'm doing. What, if I can't explain it, something wrong. Most things, 
should be easy to articulate in something that can be synthesized, uh, condensed and, and explained easily. And, and so I think it's a great, a great part of the job that brings clarity to the purpose of the underlying research. And I suppose another side of that is that the public response towards, towards migrant crises generally is, and I say this, this is something that I myself am, I conform to, it's quite emotive. Most people would see you know, refugee and migrant crises as, as a kind of a humanitarian issue, but your work has been about seeing, doing it from a kind of development perspective. And obviously, as you've mentioned, you're, you know, you're an academic, you work in a very kind of technical way, and it's very, not to like, protect, uh, act as if the, the two aren't uh, entirely separate, but you approach it in a more kind of rational way. Is that difficult for you to navigate? Because surely for everyone, my, like refugee and migrant crises are a kind of very emotive and humanitarian thing. And you've got to be so kind of rational about it. Yeah, it is emotive, um, and in a way, it should be because it it's about people's lives. Um, I mean, people people are drowning in the Mediterranean and the English Channel. Um, people are able to eat or not eat, depending on what happens with humanitarian assistance. People's aspirations and opportunities are shaped by asylum and refugee policies. So. It, it's serious and it's got to be right and it's understandable that that people are very invested in it i think i mean i have an experience of of being trolled and criticized by the right on social media i i know what that's like but i also know what it's like to be criticized by by the left um and so it's doing something right then it's getting hit from both sides right? yeah and it's it's feeling that okay the right often don't like what I've got to say because it's it's coming from a place of saying refugees have rights and we need to respect them. But often the far left doesn't like what I have to say, but it's because it's coming from a place of thinking through, okay, how can we reconcile states, markets and refugees? And the kind of leeway to say, okay, states have some constraints markets are one of the best ways we have to help and support people that's easy to sort of interpret as saying okay there's a liberal agenda here and um even liberalism um can be strongly critiqued so i think sometimes the evidence and the attempt to make that evidence um politically relevant or policy relevant opens you up to a lot of criticism um, but you get quite a thick skin and I think the important thing is is to keep reminding yourself why you do what you do and one of the balances balancing acts is as an academic you have the luxury of pure critique now I that's not a role I want to take I don't want to just be about pure critique I also want to be able to say okay if I'm going to knock houses down what do we metaphorically rebuild in their place um, and as soon as you do that and sort of say, okay, here's the alternative vision, here's the different way of doing things, you open yourself up to, to criticism. But that, that's how it should be. That's how we start debate. And I think the key thing in public debate on all policy issues is, is to make it um, civil, respectful, and recognize that difference and robust argument are partly how we, we get to a better world. Yeah. This, this might sound like a ridiculous question because obviously your field is political science, but to what extent do you see what you're doing as, as in politics in the, in, the, in the way that most people would understand the word? Because it's interesting that you say that you've had criticism from the left or from the right, but from your point of view, surely you're, you're an academic, you're thinking about kind of what's best for refugees, you know, economically and, and how that all works. Do you see that as, well, this is it's kind of not a normative question? Or do you see yourself as weighing in on the political debate that obviously is going on at the moment about kind of, you know, should we open our borders? So politics is about how we organise our society. What kind of society do we want? And academia has a role to play in that. I mean, there are, there are lots of pillars that support a healthy democracy. It's not just kind of um, executive, legislative and judiciary as branches of government. It's also the media as as a check and balance and academia has a role to play because it's about creating longer term knowledge and understanding that engages and supports evidence-based public policy and supports a more evidence-based form of, of politics 
So to see academia as, as entirely removed from politics, I think would be wrong. The question is what place does it play? And, and this is where I sort of, I shy away from terms like activist. I don't see myself as an activist. I see myself as someone um, trying to do research that is academic research on issues I care about and articulate that to the public. Now, in some cases, um, I have um, normative convictions and those normative convictions, when they're supported by the evidence, I'm also gonna push fairly strongly. Um, but those normative convictions are basically, um, basically the elements of liberalism, the idea that if we can create more freedoms for more people without making other people worse off, then that's a good thing. But those assumptions kind of underlie my work. Now, political science is made up of, of different areas. It's made up of comparative politics, crudely about domestic politics and comparing across nation states, international relations, which is about the international side, and of course, political theory. And political theory is about normative debates. It's about the underlying ethics about what we do. And so in my work, I try to combine the comparative politics, the international relations and the political theory so that when I do make normative assumptions, I'm at least aware of what they are, can articulate what they are and, and the basis for them. So, for instance, I've got a book coming out next year with Oxford University Press called The Wealth of Refugees. And it's, it's obviously sort of playing on Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations idea, and it's a political economy work. Now, the sections of that are ethics, economics, politics and policy. And the reason for that is I've got to start with the normative assumptions about the world we want to create in order to even begin to think about what the evidence tells us about what works in order to then think about what persuades people to implement the things that work. So there's normative foundations you can't get away from, but I think as an academic, the key is to try and make them as, as explicit as possible. Okay, okay. Um, so we, we, we talked a, a little bit earlier about, about, about the work that you did and seeing refugees from a kind of developmental point of view you know viewing them as economic contributors and that and that's what you did in, in the jordan compact to what extent do you think that we should see the kind of developmental and humanitarian perspectives as as the same thing like, is it a human right for them to be able to kind of work and, and be economic contributors rather than being kind of the, the limited rights that we see refugees have in lots of countries do you think that we should we should see them as one and the same issue yeah i mean refugee protection is a humanitarian issue it's a human rights issue, but it's also a development issue. Um, I mean, when people flee a crisis, conflict or persecution, they very often have extreme vulnerabilities and, and they need response. They need food, clothing, shelter, and crucially, a set of rights, the right not to be returned to a country where they face serious harm. So that, that's the crux of it. But in addition to that, one of the problems we've seen around the world is long-term so-called protracted refugee situations where Refugee camps last not five, not 10 years, but sometimes 20 years or more. And children are born into those camps. They grow up in those camps, they become adults in those camps. And traditionally, they often haven't had the right to work, freedom of movement, or other basic socioeconomic rights. And so that leads you to recognize that actually, many of these people don't just have vulnerabilities, they also have capabilities. They have skills, they have talents, they have aspirations. How can we make more of that? so that people can live in dignity and with some degree of purpose in the countries, some of the poorest countries in the world, that host the overwhelming majority of refugees. And so it's that premise that leads me to go, okay, this is also a development issue. That when we ask many refugees what they want, they want to be able to have meaningful work, they want to be able to have an education, they want to be able to be productive where they are and support themselves and their families and have longer term prospects so that when they go home, they can rebuild the country they're from, or if they get resettled or move elsewhere, they can access a job and be part of the labour market. And the reality of the default response to refugees of camps, urban destitution, or getting on a boat, don't serve those functions. They don't lead, in most cases, to human flourishing. So the development idea is to say, let's change that. Let's reinvent what camps can be. Let's come up with alternatives to refugee camps. Let's do most of that where most refugees are, which is some of the poorest countries in the world. But let's also recognize that when refugees do come to Europe, North America, Australia, 
they can also be contributors, not just economically, but socially and culturally, and that we need to support the whole human being, not just work on the assumption that these people are necessarily just vulnerable or just a burden. And the key to creating a sustainable refugee system, not just now, but in future when we have the results of climate change displacement, will be supporting people to help themselves and their communities, to be engaged contributors. And yes, it is a humanitarian issue. Yes, we've got to support people, with, but it's not just that. It's also about development and about capabilities. Well, that, that's very interesting. On that note, that's um, pretty much all we've got time for. I know you're, you're a very busy man, so um, thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot, Elliot. Great talking no to you. I look forward to reading your book. Thanks very much. Thank you.